Praise God. Amen. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you rejoicing in the fact that we are able to be here together in your house to praise and worship you. Truly, you are the only one who deserves our praise and our worship. <coughs> Father, I pray first and foremost for the forgiveness of sins, of anything we've done, thought, said, or even felt that is unlike you, Lord. We pray that you will remove uh, any attempt of Satan or his angels from this place that would cause your word to not be heard. Father, for our hearts, I pray for good ground. Receptive hearts, Father, to receive the word that you have for us today. Lord, we pray for a greater outpouring of your spirit. Lord, we desperately need it. Amen. I need it, Father, to be able to communicate these things in an effective way and your people need it to be able to receive it, Father. We need it all the way around. As for me, I pray that utterance might be given me that I might open my mouth and proclaim the gospel of which I am an ambassador. Let your will be done this day. And we thank you for hearing me and answering this prayer. Not because anything that we deserve, but you have promised that you would give the Holy Spirit simply if we ask. You have also promised to give us wisdom, Lord, and I need wisdom. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, this is my final uh, Sabbath with you guys for a while. Um, not forever, <laughs> by God's grace. And I thought to end in the same way that I began. The first time I preached, I shared a quote with you that it's kind of been the driving force for me, anyway. And um, this was the quote. Okay. It says, I saw that who? The remnant were not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we are having the last message. My accompanying angel cried out with awful solemnity, Get ready, get ready, get ready, for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy, and ye are not ready. Then the next statement comes, it says, Rend your what? Heart. Heart and not your garment. A great work must be done for who? Amen. Many of them are dwelling upon little trials, said the angel. Legions of angels are around you and are trying to press in their awful darkness that you may be ensnared and taken. You suffer your minds to be diverted too readily from the work of preparation and the all-important truths of these last days. Ye and ye dwell upon little trials and go into minute particulars of little difficulties to explain them to the satisfaction of this one or that. Conversations has been protracted for hours between the parties concerned, and not only has their time been wasted, but servants of God are held to listen to them. When the hearts of how many? Both parties are unsubdued by grace. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would remove most difficulties. Amen. Angels have been grieved and God displeased by hours which have been spent in justifying who? Self. Self. Yeah. I saw that God will not bow down and listen to the long justifications, and he does not want his servants to do so. And thus precious time be wasted that should be spent doing what? Showing transgressors the errors of their ways and pulling souls out of the fire. This was my guiding light. I didn't put the, the, um, uh, 
the reference to this, but it's in early writings that I can, I can share with you later. The, the thrust of this, for me, when I read it, was that saying, rend your hearts and not your garments. See, in my religious experience, I came up into a, um, uh, you know, um, a group or a belief that is, you know, more readily known as present truth, right? And, and it's not necessarily that there was an issue with the present truth. I believe it was an issue with the way that the present truth was, that it was communicated. So it left me with the impression that in order to get ready, this idea of getting ready, I had to not listen to this, I had to not watch this, I had to not drink this, I had to not eat this, and I had to, there's a lot of things that I had not to do. That's, that's the way that my mind absorbed it. Now, it may not be the way that the, the minister meant to communicate it, but that's the way that I received it. And, and, and so in this, I see there's a, there's a change of view here from the external, which would be your garment, to the internal, which is your what? Your heart. And she followed that statement up by saying, there is a great work that must be done for who? <laughs> Now I get the privilege of going out and ministering to um, you know, people who don't know, right? Not the remnant yet, right? Um, and, and I get to give Bible studies to, to people who don't know, but here she's telling me that there is a work that needs to be done, not just for those who don't know the truth out there, but for those who profess to know the truth right here at home. We've had a lot of these past couple of weeks, we've had a lot of inreach going on. A lot of inreach, and, and in my time here, I've had a particular focus. And it, and it could be because by, um, you know, because of my religious, you know, experience. But my particular focus has been to seek to reorient us with the law of God. You see, we have a certain view of the law of God that I believe causes us to focus a lot on our garments. And it causes us to lose focus from our heart and we focus on the external. So my goal has been to reorient us, right? To get a proper view. So I'm going to seek to try to go through some of the things that, I, that I've said in previous time. This time it'll be a little bit more plain and direct. All right. So, I need to move quickly. I think one of the biggest issues that we have is our definition of sin. The biblical definition of sin is, as we will recite, 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And when I first, you know, kind of brought this up, I, I, I sought to bring a little, you know, just to say, hey, you guys ever noticed this word also? Have you guys ever thought about that when you read it or when you were recited, right? Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law. It seems as though that in committing sin, you're doing something else, but in doing that something else, you're also transgressing the law. Almost as a secondary kind of thing. And then it says, for the sin, for sin is the transgression of the law. And I said, well, why is that? And, and, this verse kind of popped up, that 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? The law. The strength of sin is the law? So we've gone into, we've gone into study mode, right? We've gone into, you know, trying to understand this. This is, this is class time, right? The, the strength of sin is the law. Well, how is that? What, is, what does that mean? How does that make sense? Well, I present to you Romans 4.15. It says, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no what? Transgression. Transgression. Now, question. Does that mean that if there were no law, there would be no sin? No. That's right. Because he also tells us in Romans 5.13, for until the law, sin was where? In the world. In the world. So sin existed in the world apart from the law, before the law. You understand? Before the law was given, sin existed in the world. But sin is not what? 
imputed when there is no law. See, this, this is, a, this is, this is such a, a beautiful thing because you start to understand a little bit more about how sin works, right? Sin is imputed. What does it mean for sin to be imputed? You ever thought about that? Like, how is sin imputed? Well, there's something else that is connected with sin. That thing that is connected with sin is guilt. You understand? So, so, so for me to impute sin simply means for me to impute guilt to you, right? That is, that is the beauty of the sanctuary message, right? When they come into the, the, the altar and they, or to the sanctuary and they lay their hands on that spotless lamb and they confess their sins, there is a transfer happening. And it is a transfer of guilt. My guilt is coming from me and is being placed on that lamb. And that blood, which holds my guilt now, in that life is taken into the sanctuary and is transferred onto the sanctuary. And at the day of atonement, what happens? That guilt then is taken from the sanctuary. Everyone who has confessed their sins and has gone into the sanctuary, that guilt is then taken from the sanctuary and it's laid on who? The scapegoat. The scapegoat. Who it belongs to. There's another hidden truth in there because the scapegoat shows us what happens in the end of the wicked. It is taken by a strong man into the wilderness and done what? Killed? No. no. He's let go. Left to die. So, so the thing that is connected with sin is guilt. Okay? Moving on. Romans 3. He says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it says to them that are what? Under, Under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become what? Guilty. Guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is a what? Knowledge. Knowledge of sin. That is the job of the law. That should be it there. That is the focus of the law. I just need to let you know that this is sin. I can't do anything else for you but let you know that this is sin. So let's deal with our definition. Um, uh, no, no, no. Before I deal with the definition. Actually, I left my Bible. Turn with me. Thank you, sir. <laughs> to uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 1. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 10. Do you want to trade? Is that the... Is that the yeah. yeah. <laughs> 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. When you're there, you can say amen. Brian, that, that citation was early writings, 119.1. 119 Thank you very much. Early writings, that first one. So, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, starting in verse 5. It says, now the end of the commandment is what? You guys are there? Now the end of the commandment is what? Okay, so what does it mean, the end of the commandments? A lot of people say this, right? They'll say Christ is the end of the law, right? And this one is telling us that the end of the law is, what's another word for charity? Love. love. That word is a very specific love, is it not? Right? That is the word agape. The end of the commandments is agape. It's love, godly love. So when it says the end, what it's saying is this is the goal to get you there, okay? So the end of the law, the end of the commandment is charity out of what? Boy, how are we going to get that? And of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. What does it unfeigned mean? There's another interesting word, unfeigned. Like if something feigned, it's fake. Right? It's not real. It's, it's pretend. So faith, real faith, right? He, he draws a distinction. And then it says, From which some have swerved, having, have turned aside unto vain janglings, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor wherefore, whereof they affirm. Thank you. Now this next this next verse I thought was interesting. Verse 8, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man uses it how? 
Meaning that there is a way that you could use the law that is unlawful, right? Like you can use the law wrong. Well, how do you use the law right? Verse 9, it says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a what? Righteous, Righteous man. But for who? Oh. The lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for man-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So, so it just told us that the law is for the ungodly. It's not for the righteous person. It's for the ungodly. It's for the sinners. It's for, it's for the people who are doing wrong things to tell them, hey, you're doing wrong things. That is what the law is for. It is not for the righteous. Who here is righteous? Okay. Next question. Who here has Jesus in their heart? Amen. Yes? Okay. Okay. We have Jesus in our heart, right? Well, Paul tells us that Jesus was made unto us righteousness. So if I have Christ in my heart, if I have Christ, I have what? Righteousness. righteousness. So therefore, if I have righteousness, then is the law for me? It is not. The law is not for me. Now, let's take that a little bit further. Romans 10.4 tells us, For Christ is the end of the law for what? Righteousness to everyone who does what? Who does that include? Is, I don't know about y'all, but I believe. And you know why this is? Because the law... It stops short. It stops short. Like, I'm going to show you guys what this is. It is a progression of revelation. That's what's happening. It's a progression of revelation. And Christ is the ultimate revelation. Okay, hang on to that. We're going to come back to it. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says, Wherefore the law was the schoolmaster to bring us unto who? Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith comes... We are no longer under who? Okay, who's the schoolmaster? The law. Right? So when we come to Christ, we no longer, dare I say, need the law? Okay, be careful. Romans 13.10 Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Well, where do we get the, uh, 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 you know, well, uh, 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. And where do we get the clearest revelation of God's character? In Christ, who says in John 14, 9, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You see, let me, let me show you guys an interesting quote about the law. This, when I saw this, I was like, wow, this is... I thought it was profound, but this comes from Patriarchs and Prophets, right? It says, if man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall. Question, what was the law of God given to Adam after the fall? I don't want you guys read ahead. <laughs> what was the law of God given to Adam after the fall? It was the sacrificial service. It was the Lamb. Because there you have a revelation of God. Yes. So it continues on. Preserved by Noah. Do we see him making altars and sacrifices? <clears throat> and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity of the ordinance of what? Circumcision. So if they would have just understood and kept the law of the sacrificial service, there would have been no need of circumcision. It's like, oh, well, how do you how do you put those two things together? Because circumcision is just a token of faith. 
So did the circumcision avail anything? No, the circumcision was a token of faith. Because I believe, therefore I do. The same thing with the lamb. Because I believe, therefore I do. It says, And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a what? A sign. sign. They would never... Oh, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. You mean that was unnecessary? They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from where? Sinai. What was proclaimed from Sinai? The Ten Commandments. So there would have been no need of him to give the commandments from Sinai if they would have just understood the message of the slain lamb. No necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon tables of stone. And had the people practiced, and this is the part that I think we miss when it comes to the Ten Commandments particularly, had the people practiced its what? The principles. The principles. The psalmist says, I have seen the end of all per perfection because your law is exceeding broad. I'm like, well, not really, it's only ten. But it's the principles that uphold the law that are exceeding broad. There would have been no need for the additional directions given to Moses. Sanctuary service, or, you know, don't uncover your father's nakedness. Or, yeah. All this, all of this stuff, unnecessary. If they would have just got it. Let's deal with the definition really quickly. So whosoever transgresses the law, uh, uh, if whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, what I did here is I placed the, the the numbers right for the Greek wording next to them, right? So you can see whosoever, this is the Greek number for it. Committed, this is the Greek number, and so on and so forth. Now you'll see something interesting here where it says transgressive, also the law. You see those, you have those three numbers, right? And and if you pay attention, you'll see some, you know, overlapping ones, right? 4160, oh, that's committed. Uh, actually, so there's something in this line, transgressive, also the law, that matches with this word committed. You guys see that? That makes sense? You guys stay with me? Okay. So it says, for sin is the transgressive. Transgression of the law. Well, that's weird, right? Because when you get here and it says, for sin is the transgression of the law, that's only one word. See, in our English, we see it and it says, that's why we say sin is the transgression of the law. And we lock that in our brains and say sin is the transgression of the law. Well, not exactly how the original language reads. In fact, the English Standard Version correctly translates it it says, everyone who makes practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. See, what you see here is this overlap between the 4160 and the transgressive, also the law. That 4160, that committed means a continual. You keep doing it, right? You just It's a continual thing. You're going to keep doing it. So a person who continues sinning is continually transgressing the law. Like, that's, that's what they're doing. It's a continual thing. But the part here where we, you know, kind of get our definition, sin is the transgression of the law, is actually one word, and it means lawlessness. It's lawlessness. Lawlessness is not an action. It is a state of being. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible tells us. For it says here, Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity, enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That is our state. We are, in our fallen state, lawless. That is, that is where we are. We're lawless, and, and there is nothing that we can do about it. Continuing, that's why Jesus gave the solution, right? In fact, that was the name of my first sermon. You must be born again. Because we need a new heart. We need a new mind. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, how many things? 
all things are become new. So we get a new heart, we get a new mind, and eventually, because that new heart and new mind are just the down payment, we get that new body as well, right? We get all things become new. So why does this matter? Why does this, why does this matter? Right? Why is this important? Well, how many medical missionaries do we have here? Okay, we got hands going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't see Kim's hand, but I know she is. <laughs> There's a principle in the medical missionary work that we learn, and we get it from Proverbs 26, 2. Right? Proverbs 26, 2 says, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Right? In medical missionary work, we teach to address the cause. Right? You have to identify the cause in order to come up with the solution. You can't just fight symptoms, right? That makes sense? Well, that's why it's important for us to understand the sin problem. Because when we understand the sin problem, when we understand the cause, we can understand the solution. See, if we think that the sin problem is just a breaking of the rules, then our solution is going to be dealing with symptoms. You understand? We're going to be focusing on, well, i got to not break the rules. That's the problem. But we have the great physician who, in the, in, right when the sin problem arose, he gave the solution. You guys remember that? It was the first promise given to the serpent in Genesis 3.15. And he said, I'm going to tell you what the solution is. Are you guys ready for the solution? Genesis 3.15, he says, and I will put what? Enmity. Enmity. The solution to the sin problem is for God to put enmity between the snake and the woman, between her seed and his seed. Does that make sense? Put enmity? What is enmity? Hatred. Hatred. Lord, how is that possible? You're not, you're not dealing with breaking the rules here. You're dealing with something else. You want to put hatred between me and this. Okay. Luke 23, 12. Interesting text. It says, in that same day, Pilate and Herod were made what? Friends together. They were made friends together, but before they were at what? Enmity. enmity. So it's weird, right? So it seems like the opposite of enmity is what? Friends. Friends. Ephesians 2.16, it says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by what? The cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Are you guys seeing the picture that I'm trying to paint? I'm, I just paint them with me because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it all together. James 4.4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the what? World is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is a what? Enemy. enemy of God. You see, there is a friendship that needs to happen. And and after the fall, naturally, naturally, we became friends of the enemy of souls. That is that is us in our natural state. We are friends with them. That's why the carnal mind is enmity against God. And his law. And his law is just a reflection of his character. You understand that? So, so the idea now is something needs to change. And we get this great, this great invitation. Right? Not everybody has to accept this invitation. But in John 15, 15, we get this great invitation. And when you're there, you can say amen. John 15, 15, we get this great invitation. And, and, and he draws a distinction between, you know, two, two classes, right? And it's good to be one, in one class or another, but I, I, have, a, I have a preference, okay? So, so it says, henceforth, I call you not what? Servants. Servants for what? 
The servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. So, so one, he has servants. And the thing with the servants is they don't know what the Lord doeth, but they know that they just better do what the Lord says. They don't know what he's up to, but if he tells them to do something, they just know they better do it. Right? It's just, okay, whatever you say, sir. Very good, sir. Absolutely, sir. Okay? That's a servant, right? So he says, but I'm not calling you a servant anymore. He says, but I have called you what? Friends. Friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have done what? Made known unto you. So the difference between a servant and a friend is that a friend seems to have a relationship that the servant does not have. The friend is privy to information that the servant is not. I don't know about you, but I would rather be a friend than a servant. <laughs> now, this is the, this, this was God's remedy for the sin problem. In fact, there's a beautiful, beautiful um, periodical that comes out of Signs at the Times. I'm going to bring a few excerpts just to kind of drive this point home. And uh, it's Signs of the Times, Jer uh, January 20th, 1890. The title of it is God Made Manifest in Christ. It says, Christ came to represent the Father. We, be we behold in him the image of the invisible God. He clothed his divinity with humanity and came to the world that the erroneous ideas Satan had been the means of creating in the minds of men in regards to the character of God might be removed. You guys do know that's what happened in the Garden of Eden, right? Eve was deceived into thinking that God was anything but love said, he's holding out on you. Don't you want to be like him? I want to be like Jesus, right? You guys want to be like Jesus? Amen. Eat the fruit. He knows that in the day you eat of him, you'll become like him. Knowing good and evil. Christ came to save fallen man, and Satan with fiercest wrath met him on the field of conflict. For the enemy knew that when divine strength was added to human strength, weakness. when divine strength is added to human weakness, man was armed with power and what? Intelligence. Intelligence. Well, that's interesting. Intelligence seems to be a dangerous thing in the realm of religion. <laughs> And could break away from the captivity in which he had him bound. Satan sought to intercept every ray of light from the throne of God. He sought to cast his shadow across the earth that men might lose the true views of God's character and that the knowledge of God might become extinct in the earth. He had caused truth of vital importance to be so mingled with error that it lost its significance. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the suffering of his creatures. Brothers and sisters, do we do this today? Do we burden his laws with needless exactions? Do we picture him as one who could take pleasure? The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one, represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. Now watch this next part closely, and it has one of my favorite words in it. It says, the what? Only. What does only mean? Only. only. <laughs> The only way, there's no other way, the only way in which he could set and keep. Now, this idea of setting something and keeping something. Set, well, you can call that justification if you want to use a big word. 
To set, to be set right is to be justified. To be kept right is to be sanctified. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar. You see, what we are striving for, there is only one way that we can obtain it. I have ended every sermon the exact same way with an appeal to you to get to know your Heavenly Father better. Amen. That men might have salvation, he came directly to man and became a partaker of his nature. Get to know him. Get to know him. The reason I speak like that and I, and I say that is because of a belief that I have. Right? Just a, it's a belief. And the belief is like this. Some things are just automatic. So we have this concept of faith and works. right? That's where we start getting into the realm of sanctification. right? Faith and works. I don't believe in faith and works. right? I don't believe in that. I believe faith works, period. Amen. You understand? Like that, so when we talk about, you know, James and, and Paul fighting against each other, when one's like, well, no, faith is the only thing that you need, but James is like, well, faith without works is dead, and it's like, you know, they're both saying the same thing. Faith is the only thing that you need. But faith works, period. That's it. Like it it is it's natural. It's just automatic. In fact, I'll give you an example of this in the Bible. Turn with me to Luke. Luke nineteen. Luke 19. And I wish we had more of this, you know, conversation, more of what happened. But from the depiction that Luke gives, it doesn't seem like there was, you know, much, right? So let's look at Luke 19, verses 1 through 9, really quickly. It says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. You, get, you guys get that, right? Yeah. It says, and could not for the press. Mercy. What is the press? The crowd. Brothers and sisters, there are people who want to see who Jesus is, but they can't because of the people. Who does the press represent? Are we in the way? The only way that we can help people to see who Jesus is is if we lift him up. Yep. Amen. It says, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a tree, into a sycamore tree, to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down, for I must abide in thy house. And he made haste, came down, and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he has gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Well, praise God. Amen. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold. What? It, it, it's like this is... Listen, watch this. It says... And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have taken my things from, or sorry, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him four, how many? Four. Fourfold? Right. Okay, did Jesus say, all right, Zacchaeus, this is what you need to do. Zacchaeus, I command you. What happened here? His faith worked. It was a true belief that sprang forth from him that gave his belief. It force was his actions that followed. Amen. Well, he's not the only one. There's a, there's a story of the prodigal son. We're all familiar with this one. And the prodigal son is, is there and he's, he's, he's spent all the stuff and he's eaten with the pigs. And he says... He says, wait a minute, my father got hired servants that's doing better than this. I mean, at least I could be that. And in turn, look at, look at Luke 15, just a couple pages over. Luke 15. Because this is interesting, verse 17, it says, 
And when he came to himself, he said, How many higher servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I have perished with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. So that's interesting. So he had this thought, right? This, he, 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 he came into contact with this, this idea, right? This, this belief if you would, that his father has servants that are doing better than him. And at the very least, he could be a servant for his father. That's what he believed. And the next verse says that he just stayed there and kept eating with the pigs. No, no. no what does it say? He, he arose and got up and went to his father. You see, it is a natural extension of his belief. John 4, we're all familiar with the woman at the well. Right? And, and I just want to look at a couple of verses on this one. Um, because she had a belief as well. John 4, 26 through 29. It says, and, and you know, she says, I know when the Messiah comes, you know, he's gonna he's gonna straighten all this out. And he says, I that speak unto you am he. And upon and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no man said, What says what seek is um, sorry, what seekest thou, or why talkest with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith unto men, Come see a man which told me all things that, that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So did she believe when he said, I'm the Messiah? Mm -hmm. yes. How do you know she believed? She well, by their fruits you shall know them. Yes. You see, it is a natural reaction. It's not something that you, you know, you gotta force yourself to do it. I tried it, brothers and sisters. I tried it, and I tried myself right out of the church. And when I came back to God, I said, God, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not gonna try and not watch this. I'm not gonna try and not listen to this. I'm not gonna try and not eat this. I'm not doing it. I'm not trying anymore. And he says, good. Because I, I never told you to do that. I told you to get to know me. Amen. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Faith works as a natural expression of our belief. You guys ever, you know, seen a busy, busy street? Right? You guys have seen a busy street? Do you guys think that if you walked across that street, it's possible for you to get hit by a car? You guys believe that? Yeah? Okay, how many people here will put a blindfold on and walk across the street? <laughs> I'm afraid for you, brother. <laughs> Naturally, what you would do faced with that situation is look both ways. Right? Nobody's going to have to say, you better look both ways. I command you to look both ways. No, you're going you're gonna to come to the street and you're going to go... And then you're going to get across the street. You're not even going to remember you look both ways. You see that? Because it works naturally. Now, the problem that we have, right, when it comes to some temptation, when it comes to sin, right, is this problem of belief. The problem is not, you know, um, what we're doing. It's why, we, why we're doing it, okay? So we have an issue with belief, right? And we're still deceived in a lot of areas, right? with this issue of gain and loss, right? So there's, there, and this is an analogy that I got from, um, oh, oh, I just, I just lost it. But he does a, he has a wonderful uh, series on YouTube. It's called The Law of Life. Um, somebody knows who I'm talking about, and I just can't remember his name. But he has a wonderful series called The Law of Life, right? So he gives this analogy, right? Because he's talking about how we make decisions, right? So you have this green door and you have this, uh, you have a red door, okay? And say those are the only two doors to get out of this room. And I tell you that if you go out of the green door, you have to pay me a thousand dollars. But if you go out the red door, I have to pay you a thousand dollars. Which door are you going out of? <laughs> Definitely the red, right? Definitely the red. Okay, so what if I said, okay, still same doors, but if you go out of the green door this time, 
I have to pay you $100, but if you go out of the red door, I have to pay you $1,000. Which door are you going out of? Red door. The red door, right? Okay, same doors. But if you go out of the green door this time, you have to pay me $100, but if you go out of the red door, you have to pay me $1. You're still going out of the red door, right? Because the way we make decisions is based on a gain and loss system. When we're faced with gain and loss, we want to take the highest gain and lose the less loss, right? So if we're faced with two losses, we want to take the least amount of loss. If we're faced with two gains, we want the most amount of gain. If we're faced with a gain and a loss, we want to take the gain, okay? Well, and that's exactly what Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's, the question is, what are you counting as gain? What are you counting as treasure? The, 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 the crazy thing about the fall is what he did was he was able to trick us into thinking that loss is gain and gain is loss. Yeah. So now our whole system is upside down. When, when, when he says, you know, thou shalt not, or he gives us a principle or a law or a rule, he says, hey, don't watch this. Well, we say, oh, man, I'm going to miss out. FOMO. We don't, we, don't see the, we don't see the fact that we're actually missing out by doing what he's telling us not to do. Everything that he is saying for us, God is not arbitrary. He does not say anything just to hear himself talk. He does not say anything for his own benefit. He does not say anything for his own benefit. Everything that he says is for the benefit of others. Why? Because God is love. It's all other-centered. It's all for you. So if he tells you not to do something, it's because he loves you. Right? And we say that, but it's like, Lord, I don't, I don't get it. Right? I, I, I would ask the question, it says, okay, well, is lying wrong? And, and most people say, yeah, lying is wrong. But then you ask them the next question, why is lying wrong? They say, well, hmm. well because, because, you know, you get in trouble when you lie. Right? Maybe some of, some of our younger ones would, you know, go with that one, right? Nobody wants to get in trouble. You don't want to get in trouble, so, you know. I was like, okay, well, so if you didn't get in trouble, would lying still be wrong? Yes. Yeah, why? Because God said it's wrong. You know? He said it's wrong. Okay, next question. If God never said lying was wrong, would it still be wrong? Yes. 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 Absolutely. But why? That's it. And, and, and it's because... You know, when you're born again, one of the things that happens is you change from thinking that selfishness is the way to live to love. Love is the way, right? We agree that love is the way, okay? Well, the thing about love is it can't exist without trust. And lying breaks down trust. Even when you lie to spare someone's feelings, honey, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> Even when you lie to spare someone's feelings, when they find out that you lied, are they happy with you? No. They say, thank you so much for trying to spare my feelings. <laughs> no, they're still upset. So our system has to be rearranged, right? And he says, be, ye, he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of of your mind, we have to come into contact with a new system of truth. And what happens is, as we come into contact with it and we believe it, we act accordingly. That's just that's just how it happens. In fact, um, in uh, what is the shout guidance? Yeah, and this is just, this is just on the dress question. It says there is no need to make the dress question the main point of your religion. Amen. Right now, I'm using this as a principle from what I'm saying. There is something richer to talk of. What is richer to talk of? Right. Jesus. And when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God might drop off. Could, possibly, will drop off. That is the natural response. And, and that is the thing about, you know, 
Like, take for example the, the unmerciful servant, the, the one who was forgiven much. His response was so unnatural. Sin is not natural, brothers and sisters. It's not. It's a perverted form of life. And so, in fact, it's so perverted you can't even call it life. It was so unnatural. That's why when the, when the, the judge came, or the, the king who he owed the stuff to, he says, wait, I showed mercy to you. Shouldn't you have showed mercy? Like, he asked the question to appeal to his reason. Shouldn't you have done that? That would have been the natural thing to do. But some of us, we, we, we hold on to these things, and, it's, and, 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 and that's why she says that one cherished sin will neutralize. Not one sin. Sometimes we can make it seem like that. So one sin is, you know, neutralize the power of the gospel. No, one cherished sin. What does that word cherish tell you? It's in the heart. So there's something that must replace that treasure. And it's the pearl of great price. And again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold what? All that he had. All that he had and bought it. So did he think that pearl was worthless? What did he believe about that pearl? How do you know he believed that? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like, this is, this is the natural response. The question is, the question is, how come we don't have that response? How come our response isn't that natural? And the, and the truth is because our hearts are not converted. Right. Right. Our hearts are not convinced that this pearl of great price is truly worth all of that. See, the truth is someone who is converted, someone who is truly converted, they may work harder than the legalists. You see, if Zacchaeus was a legalist, he said, I, I would, he would have said, I will give everyone every single cent back that I, that I took falsely. I'll give them every single cent that I took falsely. But that's not what he said. He said, I will give it back how many fold? Fourfold. When it comes from the heart, when it comes from the right place, it has a whole totally different savor to it. The question is, who has the heart? Steps to Christ, she asked this question because, you know, the person who may be wrestling, you know, am I converted? Is my heart converted? Well, she says, well, here's a small template that you could use if you're, if you're curious. Who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our, you know, mediocre energies? Our, you know, leftover energies? Who has our best energies? Our best energies. What do we give ourselves to? Oh, 2024 is coming around. Boy, that's going to be, that's going to be par for a lot of conversation. Will Trump run again? Oh, no, I think he already decided he's running again. Who's he going to go against? Is Biden going to live through this next term? <laughs> you know, some of us, we get caught up in this, you know, political stuff. As if this world were our home. There's something sweeter to talk about, brothers and sisters. Yeah. If Christ, if we are Christ, our thoughts are with him. Our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, please him in all things. That's the reality. That's natural. And if that's not our experience, brothers and sisters, we're playing. We're playing and we're not ready. Rend your hearts and not your garments. So I'm going to touch on a couple of things and then I'm going to draw this to a close. 
this idea of sin, right? Because oftentimes I, you know, I, I, I was actually going through a bit of a struggle, you know, with this, with this concept, right? Because, because the thing is, where the law of God is, there's liberty, you know, like there's freedom, you know, like it's, it's the law of love gives freedom, right? So it's like, man, so God, what matters? You know, like what matters? And the answer came back from my wife, nothing and everything. But God does not look at all sin as equally bad. To him, as to us, some sins are worse than others. But even if some wrong act seems, or some wrong act appears small to us, no sin seems small to God. You guys get that? There are levels, but none of them are small. There's no such thing as a little white lie. Right? Proverbs 12, 22, it says, Lying lips are an abomination to God. It does not give that lo those lying lips a color. Okay? It says, Human judgment is often wrong, but God sees things as they really are. People dislike a drunk person and say his sin will keep him out of heaven. But often, these same people say nothing against pride, selfishness, and greed. Yet these sins are especially, especially offend. Oh, these are the sins that especially offend God because why? Why do they offend Him? Because they are so unlike His character. You guys see what matters? It is the character. See, what you do does not make you what you are. Does that make sense? Like, like. A fish does not swim to prove that it's a fish. And that's the thing that we've done with this whole faith and works thing. We've worked, worked, worked to prove that we're Christians, to prove that we're the remnant. But, but it's backwards. The fish swims because it's a fish. It does what is natural to itself. These sins are so unlike the loving character. Unselfish love fills every heart in heaven. And if we want to be there, then we must allow unselfish love to fill our hearts. Amen. See, see, while we're thinking about, you know, people who cherish those sins of, I don't know, music or food and things like that, these are the sins that we need to be most worried about. You know why, though? Because oftentimes these sins can pass as something else. Right? You, you guys notice all the good deeds that go on? That was, I was visiting a friend and, 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 and we were watching the game. Right? The, 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 the game with the Bengals and the, and, the, and the Chiefs. Right? We were watching the game. And, and they had this moment in it where they were like, you know, oh, NFL Player of the Year for charity. And, and they showed... The, the guy who won the award doing all these charitable events. And you look at that and say, wow, he's so selfless. But everywhere he went, there was a camera. You know, I think the Catholics were on to something with this idea of the seven deadly sins. You guys heard of their seven deadly sins, right? No? No? Okay, well, these are the seven deadly sins according to the Catholics. Lust, gluttony, greed, laziness, wrath, envy, pride. Those are the seven deadly sins. These are, uh, these are you know, most of these sins can, can, can pass underneath, right? Like even gluttony, you know, we take that a little bit further. They just say it's excessive eating. You can look at that and say, oh, you eat a lot, right? But the Bible says, you know, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And then the next part says, who minds earthly things. Right? Because, because the fact that you are so consumed with consuming just tells you where your heart is. It's here on this earth. It's for the satisfaction of my flesh. Greed, laziness, laziness. How many people have heard a sermon on laziness? Yeah, you have? I have not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so rare. Wrath, 
we, we've talked about that. Envy, pride. And, and then there's this quote here that I thought was so interesting because out of, out of these three, right, pride, selfishness, and greed, you know, out of those three, there's only one that doesn't show up, and it's selfishness, right? And she says, another book was opened wherein were recorded the sins of those who profess the truth. Who's that? Who's that? Us, right? It says, under the general heading of what? Selfishness came every other sin. Let me tell you a natural response of a, of a reaction of Jesus, the woman at the well. She had a relationship. She had an experience with him. She believed what he said. And what did she do next? She went and told him. Why is it that we have to have all these workshops? Why is it that we have to have all this stuff to motivate the people to get out and do something that should be natural? Amen. Something is missing. We are missing something. Under the general heading of selfishness came every other sin. The reason why we're not getting up and going is because we're too concerned with I. I may not be good enough. I may not know all the stuff. I may not this. I may not that. I can't speak. I'm afraid. Do you believe what he said? Or do you believe he'd let you fall? Oh, no, I get it. We don't trust him. We don't trust him. That's what it is. We don't trust them. And it makes sense because I don't make a habit of trusting people I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I don't make a habit of doing that. <coughs> there are also headings under every column, and underneath these, opposite each name, were recorded in their respective columns, the lesser sins. And she goes on. That's actually an interesting quote. Fourth volume of the Testimonies 3, 84, paragraph 3. Go ahead and read it. It's potent. Oh, yeah. This is, this is the one I wanted to end off on because it's... I couldn't say it better. The completeness, right? I want to be perfect. Anybody here want to be perfect? That's, that's been my thing since I came into the, into the faith. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I want to be perfect. It's like, Lord, yeah, let me help me with that. And he says, the completeness of Christian character is attained when what? What's that word? Impulse. The impulse. What is an impulse? Desire. Right, it's just something that... It's impulsive. Like, when you buy something almost without thinking, they call that an impulse buy, right? It's, it's something that you do... Automatically. It says, when the impulse to help and bless others spring occasionally, constantly from within. Not pressured from without. Guys, we, we got to get out here and witness the Wilcox. When the impulse to help and bless others spring constantly from within, it is the atmosphere of love surrounding the soul of believers that makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work. That's what we're aiming for. But how to get this? How do you get this? You have to spend time with someone who impulsively needs to bless, almost compulsively. Have you guys read Mark? Like, whenever he sees suffering, it says he was moved with compassion. It's like, it's like man, I'm going to do something else, but oh man, I just got to help this person. Right? Like, that's his character. You have to spend time with him. Spend time with him. See how he works in your life and how he constantly wants to bless you. Does you do you believe he wants to bless you? Or do you believe he takes pleasure in your suffering? Oh brothers and sisters, there is a richness 
and, and beholding the character of God. Amen. And it is only by beholding that we can become changed. How many of you understood what we talked about today?